The audience, the program will begin very shortly. So please turn on your camera. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the UN Delsa Korea Forum. I am Du Sop Shin, the moderator of this opening. And I would like to thank you for joining us today. Now, we start the forum on strengthening public governance and accelerating digital transformation of local government for emergency response and digitalization of local economy in the post COVID 19 era. Now, Mr. Lee Jae Kim, President of Korea, is going to deliver the welcome speech. Let's give a big hand to Mr. Kim. Are you? Uh, should I start first? Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, because of the time difference, I have say two greetings. Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, Mr. Sunun Kim, Chairperson, Presidential Committee on Autonomy and Decentralization in Korea. Mr. Bo Kyun Shim, Head of United Nations Project Office on Governance. Professor Pan Seok Kim, Yonsei University. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pleasure to address the UN DESA Krila Forum on strengthening public governance and accelerating digital transformation of local government for emergency response and revitalization of local economy in the post COVID-19 era. I'm indeed delighted to be hosting this forum, even in the midst of the challenges posed by COVID-19. I send the warmest welcome to all of the speakers and participants, most of whom are joining this event virtually. There is no denying that the COVID-19 pandemic is the defining, defining challenge of our generation. Today, the world has an important opportunity to come together and turn the costly lessons of this pandemic into a united drive to build a more inclusive, sustainable future for all. The global economy is facing a devastating recession. More than a billion children are out of school, and it is the most vulnerable and weakest members of humanity that are bearing the brunt of the crisis. The crisis is having a deep effect on local governance around the world. The outbreak has a profound effect on local public health, on unprecedented impact on local economies around the world, and it magnified existing social issues, including inequality. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to overcome this crisis, strengthening international cooperation based on multi-stakeholder partnerships are paramount. Building partnerships among governments, international organizations, international financial institutions, the private sector, and the civil society has never been more critical. Indeed, in the depths of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have witnessed many different partners coming together in unprecedented ways to unleash innovation, such as the remarkable development of vaccine in record time and the rapid adoption of digital technology around the world. We need to take advantage of this paradigm shift, particularly engagement and collaboration with all local stakeholders are required not optional, to ensure the delivery of essential service, services to all, including vulnerable groups. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, digital technologies have enabled governments to connect with people and to continue to deliver services online and play the central role for communication, leadership, and collaboration between policymakers and society. In this context, 
I look forward to seeing this forum serving as an important platform to share insightful ideas and discuss ways and means to further promote partnerships and cooperation for constructive endeavors during this very challenging time. Once again, my deep thanks also go to all the speakers and distinguished participants from around the world and all those who worked so hard in organizing this meaningful, good forum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Bean. Let's give him a big hand once again. Next, Mr. Bo Byun Shin, head of Ong Prog, is going to deliver the welcome speech. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kim Soon Hoon, chairperson of the Presidential Committee on Autonomy and Decentralization, uh, Republic of Korea. Mr. Il Jae Kim, President of Krilla, uh, and Professor Pan Seok Kim, previous Minister of Government Personal Innovation, uh, distinguished participants and speakers from all over the world, ladies and, and gentlemen, it is my great honor to welcome you to the UN DESA Krilla Forum, co-organized by the UN Project Office on Governance, a part of DPIDG of UN DESA together with Krilla. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Krilla, including President of Krilla Ilje Kim, for jointly organizing this important event addressing the critical role of a local government in response to COVID-19 and preparing for the post-COVID-19 year, which is a pressing challenge to all of us. We have witnessed the critical role of local governments uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic situation as the first responders to develop and implement the emergency response measures at the local level. Due to the proximity of to, to citizens, uh, local governments have been at the forefront uh, of identifying the emergency situations on the ground and delivering essential services and the emergency assistance to citizens including the disadvantaged and vulnerable populations. The significant repercussions of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy, particularly on jobs and loss of uh, income, also Ooh. give prominence to local governments, governments and call for a more proactive Ooh. role of them in uh, revitalizing the economy in the post-COVID-19 era. Emergency assistance and measures by local government, governments are critical to minimizing the negative effects of COVID-19 on local economies, especially to micro and small sized enterprises and to preparing for non-contact based industries in the post COVID-19 era. In this context, today's forum will address two important and closely related uh, dimensions of strengthening public governance and accelerating digital transformation of local government. First, local governance with the local governments at the center should take an active role with ownership and accountability for emergency response and local economy revitalization in the post COVID-19 era. Local governments should effectively engage local communities civil society organizations, private sector, expert groups, and citizens to foster innovative strategies and solutions to COVID-19 and recovery in the local context. To strengthen local governance, effective national to local governance for policy coordination and better coordinated resource mobilization and allocation at the local level is important technical financial support between national and local, as well as among local authorities, is also instrumental in forging resilient and inclusive recovery. At the same time, ICT and the digital technologies have been playing a pivotal role, and COVID-19 has become the new driver for digital transformation to embrace the digital new normal, especially 
the uh, central role of cities and local governments in responding to the needs of the uh, citizens with innovative digital platforms, tools, and smart technologies during the pandemic has further accelerated the advancement of digital transformation of local governments. Accelerating digital transformation at the local level requires strategies and initiatives to ensure effective national local government collaboration. It also calls for coordination and policy coherence across different departments with local government, as well as effective public private people partnerships by establishing an enabling environment. Ladies and gentlemen, strengthening public governance and accelerating digital transformation of local government all require development of new skills and knowledge and mindset changes of government officials as well as other stakeholders at all levels. It also calls for a paradigm shift with new approaches, strategies, practices for innovative solutions. This will also be very critical to further strengthen the important role of local governments and other local actors in achieving the 2030 agenda. Now with less than a decade until 2030, active engagement of local communities and citizens and the effective harnessing of digital technologies and innovative solutions will be imperative for accelerating the pace of achieving the SDGs, which has been significantly hampered during the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope that today's forum can serve as a meaningful opportunity to share diverse innovative approaches, strategies, and experiences and build partnerships among countries and across sectors. Before I conclude, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to all distinguished speakers who have joined us today to share their insights and experiences on this very important topic. I wish you a fruitful discussion and a successful event. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Mr. Shim. Let's give him a big hand once again. Today we have a distinguished keynote speech. Mr. Sunan Kim, Chairperson, Presidential Committee on Autonomy and Decentralization, will give you a keynote speech. Let's give him a big hand. Great. Thank you very much, Director Kim. 네, 여러분 안녕하십니까? 네, 방금 소개받은 대통령 소속 자치분권위원회 위원장 김순원입니다. 유엔 거버넌스 센터와 한국지방행정연구원이 공동 주최하는 이번 포럼에서 기조연설을 하게 되어 매우 기쁘게 생각합니다. 올해는 1991년 지방의회 의원 선거로 대한민국의 지방자치가 부활된 지 30주년이 되는 뜻깊은 해입니다. 우리나라의 지방자치는 1949년 지방자치법 제정과 공포에 따라 1952년 지방의원 선거로 처음 실시되었습니다. 그러나 1961년 군사정변으로 중단되었다가 1987년 6월 민주화 항쟁으로 얻어진 헌법 개정에 이어 김대중 전 대통령의 목숨을 건 단식으로 다시 부활을 맞게 되었습니다. 1991년 지방의회 의원 선거와 1995년 지방자치단체장 선거가 실시된 이후 평화적 정권 교체, 행정정보 공개 조례, 주민 참여 예산 제도 등 민주적 제도와 주민 눈높이의 지방 행정으로 주민의 삶의 질이 높아진 성과도 있었지만 중앙과 지방의 관계에 초점을 둔 단체 자치에 비중을 두면서 주민 참여에 기초한 실질적인 자치 분권은 부족했다고 평가할 수 있습니다. 이에 문재인 정부는 연방제 수준의 자치 분권 국가를 실현하기 위하여 주민 주권 구현을 목표로 다양한 정책들을 추진하여 큰 성과를 거두고 있습니다. 제 1단계 재정 분권을 완료하여 지난해부터 매년 8.5조 원씩 지방 재정이 확충되었으며 제 1차 지방 일괄 이양법의 제정으로 중앙 권한의 지방 이양 방식이 획기적으로 변모하였습니다. 특히 32년 만에 지방자치법 전부 개정하여 주민주권 구현의 제도 독토레가 마련됨과 동시에 지방정부는 국정의 동반자 지위를 갖게 되었습니다. 또한 지난 7월 1일부터는 자치경찰제가 전국에서 전면 시행됨에 따라 협력적 거버넌스에 기초한 치안의 공동책임이라는 성과도 창출하였습니다.
1991년 지방의회 의원 선거로 지방자치가 실시된 이후 지난해 지방자치법이 전부 개정되기까지 30년은 자치단체 중심의 권한과 책임을 제도화하여 지방자치 제도의 기본 토대를 마련한 지방자치 1.0 시대였다면 앞으로의 30년은 자치분권을 고도화하여 주민 중심의 지방자치를 완성해 나가는 자치분권 2.0 시대라고 할수 있겠습니다. 자치분권 2.0 시대의 핵심은 주민이 중심이 되는 주민자치입니다. 주민주권 사상과 보충성의 원칙에 따라 지방의 정책결정과 집행과정에 주민참여를 확대하여 주민 스스로 자신의 삶을 바꾸는 것이라 할 것입니다. 이는 각 지역에서 직면하고 있는 문제점과 현안은 그 지역 주민이 제일 잘 알고 있기 때문입니다. 아울러 지역 문제에 주민이 참여하여 스스로 문제를 해결하게 되면 지역 주민의 삶의 질이 향상되고 행정에 대한 만족도도 높아지게 될 것입니다. 또한 재정분권을 통해 중앙과 지방의 협력관계가 더욱 공고해질 것입니다. 지방의 전문성과 자율성이 강화되어 지방정부와 의회 간의 견제와 균형이 정상적으로 작동하게 되고 중앙정부와 지방정부도 지도감독의 상호관계가 아닌 협력적 동반자 관계로 나아가게 될 것입니다. 코로나19는 지방자치의 재발견이라는 수식어를 이끌어낼 만큼 지방정부에 대한 신뢰성과 자치분권의 중요성을 높이는 계기가 되었습니다. 코로나19 대응 과정에서 초기 방역 성과를 이뤄낼 수 있었던 것은 선제적이고 적극적으로 방역 행동을 추진한 지방정부의 역할이 있었기 때문입니다. 저는 이번 코로나19 대응을 보면서 지방정부의 역할이 대단히 중요하다는 것을 새삼 실감하게 되었습니다. 앞으로 코스 포스트 코로나 시대에는 지방의 자치 역량 강화를 통해 지방정부에 대한 신뢰를 더욱 높이는 것이 중요하다고 하겠습니다. 이를 위해서는 지방정부의 혁신적, 혁신적인 정책 시도와 거버넌스 혁신과 함께 실질화된 주민주권과 주민참여를 활성화해야 할 것입니다. 특히 지역 소멸 위기를 극복하기 위해서는 범정부적인 지원과 연계협력체계에 기초한 지역 소멸 위기 공동 대응을 위한 노력도 필요할 것입니다. 자치분권위원회는 지난 4월 국가균형발전위원회와 공동으로 기획재정부, 행정안전부, 산업통상자원부 국토교통부 및 관련 부처가 참여하는 메가시디지원 봉부처 TF를 출범시켜 분권적인 국가균형발전을 모색하고 있습니다. 앞으로 유관기관 간 긴밀한 연계협력체계를 구축하여 분권적인 체제에 기초한 국가균형발전을 이룩할 수 있도록 다각적인 정책적 노력도 다해갈 것입니다. 국가균형발전을 위해 올해에도 제2차 지방일괄이양법 제정을 추진하는 한편 제2단계 재정분권을 완성해 지방재정을 더욱 확충하는 등 자치분권의 남은 과제를 성실히 수행할 계획입니다. 우리 이와 같은 우리나라의 경험이 세계 많은 나라에도 다소나마 도움이 될수 있는 관행과 관행으로 이어지기를 기대합니다. 예, 본 포럼의 선곡적 개최를 기원하며 예, 키노우트 스피치에 가름합니다. 네, 감사합니다. I'm a professor of public administration at Yonsei University in Mie campus and uh, uh, a member of the International Civil Service Commission of the United Nations. Well, first of all, many thanks go to the head of uh, Unpog and Krila, uh, Mr. Shin bo Mr. Kim il -je. I think you organized a wonderful uh, forum today. Many thanks. The first session on strengthening public governance of local government has two distinguished presenters and two discussants. Let me introduce them very briefly. The first presenter is Professor Sabin Kuhlman, who is Chair of Political Science, Public Administration and Organization at the University of Potsdam in Germany. I have known Professor Sabin Kuhlman for a number of years, and she has a long list of CV but let me mention just a couple of things. She is a well-known academic leader in Germany, 
and she is one of the leading public administration scholars in Europe. And she is currently vice chair of the German National Regulatory Control Council, as well as vice president of IIAS, which I served for many years. The second presenter is my colleague, Professor Myung Jae Moon, uh, who is currently Dean of the College of Social Sciences and the Director of the Institute for Future Government at Yonsei University. Professor Moon is also one of the leading Korean PA scholars, and he is a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, so-called NAPA in the US. Professor Kuhlman and myself, we are also a member of uh, NAPA. We have two discussants, and the first discussant is Madam Erna Irawati, who is lecturer of the School of Administration and the director of the Center for Policy and Program Development for Government Officials Competency at the National Institute of Public Administration in Indonesia. Last but not least, Dr. Hyunuk Park is Associate Research Fellow at the Korea Research Institute for local administration, so-called Krilla. Since we have just one hour for this session, a presenter can speak for less than 15 minutes and a discussant can speak for five minutes. After that, I hope we can have a Q&A session. Now, without further delay, may I invite the first speaker, my friend, Professor Sabin Kuhlman. Sabin, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pan So Kim. Um, thanks so much for this very kind introduction. Uh, and also thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm very honored and pleased uh, to present here in front of this distinguished audience. Um, my presentation uh, will be focused on the topic strengthening public governance of local government lessons from the COVID-19 crisis. I will predominantly focus uh, on the, the example of Germany coping with the COVID-19 crisis from a local government perspective. Next slide, please. Um, before um, entering into the German example, I would just briefly remind that, that from a European perspective, of course, we do not have only uh, one type of local governance uh, or local government, but we have various. So we have a kind of variety of local government systems. At, at least six types can be distinguished uh, from the uh, different historical perspectives, the different historical backgrounds. Uh, so we have uh, the uh, Napoleonic countries with a, a Napoleonic um, history, France, Greece, uh, Italy and others. Uh, then uh, we make a distinction to the federal type, continental European federal type, including the federal countries of Germany, Switzerland, Austria. We have the Nordic system, the Anglo-Saxon system, but then uh, also in, in Eastern Europe, Eastern European type of, of local government. So uh, we have this broad variety of different types of local government systems uh, in Europe. Next slide, please. Uh, however, what is what all these types and countries have in common that over the last um, 20, 30 years, um, local government capacities have been significantly increased uh, all over Europe. So in many European countries, the functional responsibilities of local governments have increased. Uh, local governments enjoy more autonomy, so the degree of local autonomy was enhanced. We have also seen, and many countries have witnessed, uh, territorial reforms, so um, municipal amalgamations, territorial structures have been upscaled, and so nowadays we enjoy more viable territorial units uh, at the local level and the performance of public administration has been increased as well 
as has citizen satisfaction with local services due to administrative modernization, new public management reforms and other kinds of, of public sector modernization. Uh, regarding uh, democratic participation, it's important to mention that in many countries, the opportunities for citizens to participate uh, in uh, local politics and local democracy have been in, enhanced. So there are more opportunities now for citizen involvement and for being for uh, participating in uh, local decision making. Next slide, please. Next slide. Well, uh, so uh, we, we have an increasing degree of local autonomy. Yet uh, there are differences across Europe. And what you can see from this slide is that the more darker areas, um, so when you, when you see in dark red color, uh, which are the Nordic countries, but also Germany and even Poland enjoy the highest degree of uh, local autonomy. Whereas those countries where you see the light colors, uh, which are mostly in the eastern part, but also uh, in more southern Europe and as well in the United Kingdom and Ireland and enjoy a lesser degree of autonomy. So these in these countries, local uh, uh, authorities are less autonomous. So that's, uh, I, I think, an interesting fact that we have these really very varying degrees of local autonomy across Europe. Next slide, please. Uh, and now let me turn to the role of local governments in the COVID-19 crisis. And I want to, to focus here on the example of Germany. Um, in, in Germany and in many other European countries as well, the local governments and in Germany also the lender, the states, have been responsible for pandemic management based on federal legislation. So we have a really uh, a very important role of the subnational governments, particularly local authorities, in managing the crisis and in deciding uh, containment measures on their own discretion. Uh, the 375 local health authorities in Germany have been central pillars of crisis response. And there was even a, a quotation from a, one of the leading newspapers in Germany saying that every public health officer of a county, the county level, has more powers in Germany than the federal minister of health. So this quotation shows you the very important and even in predominant role of local governments in crisis management. Uh, so most of the containment measures have been first taken by local governments and then upscaled at other levels of government, such as school closures, mask obligation and so on. However, due to uh, an, a number of factors, uh, local government increasingly reached their capacity limits uh, by end of 2020. Uh, and so more than 70% of all infection cases were not traceable anymore. So the comprehensive trace and track system, which was established at the local level, reached its limits uh, due to staff shortage at the local level, uh, due to some coordination problems with uh, medical practitioners, hospitals and so on. But also what is very important, um, that there was a lack of digital opportunities. So uh, in terms of digitalization, um, local health authorities, but public administration in Germany in general, uh, uh, has a, a strong need to be improved. And so they were, uh, there was a lack of digital preparedness. Um, so against this background, over the course of the crisis, uh, local discretion was increasingly curbed. So there were more and more trends of centralization and of uh, taking back local autonomy in managing the crisis. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and so uh, from the beginning of the crisis in 2020, uh, until most recently, April 2021, uh, five phases of containment reaction can be distinguished in the intergovernmental system. We, we, we started from a very local approach and a reliance uh, on local management. 
uh, turned then to more unitarization, centralization, with the case numbers increasing, with the crisis uh, 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 increasing. And then with some relief over the summer months in 2020, there was uh, a re-emphasis on local discretion and more variance. And again, uh, the pendulum swung back to more centralism, more intergovernmental coordination, more unitarization. And I would, I would say, I would argue today, we are in the phase five of, of uh, managing the crisis. Um, and this can be called as a trend towards more centralization and less local autonomy. Next slide, please. However, looking at the role of local governments, uh, we, we observe that uh, at the local level in managing the crisis, more agile and more flexible reactions and solutions uh, have been possible. Um, and in general, we see local governments as a kind of resilience promoting institutions for crisis mitigation. So they are very important uh, actors when it comes to assure and to guarantee resilience in crisis management. That has to do with uh, their uh, functional, their broad functional responsibilities. Uh, with their multi-purpose profile uh, within which they are able to horizontally coordinate different tasks, different departments. They can shift resources from one department to the other. So they are more able to horizontally coordinate in the territory than, for instance, a ministry or a state authority. Uh, and therefore, for them, for local authorities, it's possible to handle the crisis from a more comprehensive and cross-cutting uh, perspective. Um, they can overcome departmental egoisms and the silo logs and silo logics uh, of management, uh, which is in Germany, for instance, also due to the directly elected powerful mayor as a local executive. So he's a very powerful uh, person uh, and, uh, and actor, uh, also because he is directly elected by, by the population. Um, and so this also uh, ensures more proximity of local management, tailor-made solutions, more uh, inclination also to experiments, uh, which is, I think, uh, important, especially in situations of uncertainty and uncertain knowledge. Next slide, please. Uh, and we can see this also from pertinent surveys uh, where the role of local governments and particularly of local health authorities is ass assessed by the citizens as fairly good. So very good or fairly good um, uh, are uh, the most important assessments by citizens vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the performance uh, of, of uh, local governments. Uh, and that, for instance, um, contrasts to, to the European Union, which has been assessed quite poorly. Uh, that's interesting in this slide here. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, and so the, the, the key question still remains, to what extent has the crisis been used as a window of opportunity for further changes, particularly for the digital transformation? And here we can again take the German example and see that uh, the, the central government, the federal government really has taken the opportunity of reinforcing investment into the digitalization uh, with economic stimulus, stimulus packages, additional measures granted to uh, local governments and uh, in its fi uh, one of the fi last bills, uh, more than 4 billion euro have been allocated uh, to local governments for uh, promoting the digitalization of public administration. Next slide, please. And that's desperately needed in Germany because from a from an international and European wide uh, comparison, we do not perform very well in terms of digital uh, government. Uh, you see, we are only in the uh, last third of countries and there are others much better than, than Germany, Estonia, uh, Netherlands, Denmark. Uh, and so the digital transformation really needs uh, um, an acceleration uh, in Germany. Next slide, please. And particularly on the local level from surveys, we know that uh, the uh, percentage of uh, services uh, um, uh, 
which are delivered by local service uh, by local governments this percentage is still very low you see 10 percent 20 percent of some services are are only uh, fully processed online so we, we really need some uh, uh, acceleration here and next slides uh, so what what kind of early lessons can we draw from this uh, local governments play a significant role in coping with multiple crises and the 21st century challenges in general that concerns on the one hand pandemic management, of course, post COVID management, but also other uh, urgent issues such as uh, in Europe, the integration of refugees and migrants from Syria and other countries, coping with climate change issues, managing the digital transformation, e-service provision, uh, and local governments play a key role in uh, um, uh, addressing these uh, issues. The crisis has been used as a window of opportunity, particularly for accelerating the digital transformation on the local level of government, yet progress and success still remains to be seen. So implementation of measures is urgently needed. Um, the decentralization and subnational discretion assure uh, flexibility, flexibility, agility, and tailor-made containment solutions. Uh, and so um, variation of solutions is uh, uh, important and necessary. However, we need a systematic evaluation of all these measures uh, to, in order to assure more evidence-based policymaking in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sabine. For your excellent presentation, we learned a lot from the German experience. As you mentioned, this crisis would be a crisis management would be a window of opportunity for digitalization in many countries. Thank you very much. Now, may I invite Professor Moon? Yes. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jay Moon from Yonsei University. Uh, I want to give my thanks to organizers and uh, Professor Kim for kind introduction. Well, I have 26 pages of PowerPoint, so I think 15 minutes will be very challenging, but I'll do my best. Uh, and Sabine actually, uh, in her last page, she talked about opportunities. And in my presentation, basically COVID-19 and public governance. And there are a lot of challenges, of course, but as Sabine mentioned, uh, there'll be uh, opportunities and prospects as well uh, by reassessing the current system and really searching for new uh, directions in future. Next page. Well, severe challenges to public governance at both local and central levels. And my presentation, basically, I will try to uh, uh, mention some of the Korean experiences uh, but also some of the uh, overall general uh, experiences by different countries. Uh, my focus will be what would be good institutional arrangement, what would be good solutions, uh, policy responses uh, at local and central level, and then the way we actually respond to a wicked problem like COVID-19. Uh, of course, and we're still uh, going through the uh, uh, COVID-19 issues, uh, maybe you know, not just the post pandemic, but with the pandemic uh, for, uh, for a while. Next page. So all governments are being tested simultaneously. Uh, some of the governments are doing good and other governments are uh, relatively doing, doing poor. Korean government has been very effectively mitigating COVID-19 and uh, we had very painful experience with the MERS in 2015 uh, so that there are a lot of a preparation made uh, out of the uh, painful experience uh, 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 from Maris. But there are ongoing learnings uh, because there are a lot of unknowns uh, 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 so that we need to respond to uh, new, new situations. Next. Uh, this is Pew Foundation uh, report, uh, just came out last week. Uh, there are, you know, of course, you know, our daily lives been uh, affected based on the uh, uh, different uh, 14 different countries' responses. And interestingly, uh, uh, South Korea mitigating uh, COVID-19 uh, 
more effectively than many other countries, but still many people in Korea still believe that uh, uh, you know, co coronavirus, COVID-19 impacted their lives quite a bit. And also women uh, are more likely to feel a uh, stronger impact uh, on their lives than male. So that I don't know, you know this is correct uh, to you or not. But you know, what I just tried to mention is there are some variations. On the one hand, well, objective uh, uh, performance of uh, COVID-19 mitigation, at the same time, perception level, it, it might be quite different. Next page. Well, there are alternative explanations. Why some of the countries are doing better and other countries uh, relatively uh, 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 you know, less uh, effective. Well, some of the people say, well, leadership matter and culture matter, government capacity, of course, political and administrative systems, or agility matters, which is one of my research focus these days, and digital government matter. And then there are social, political, economic dimensions as well. What about income level, democracy, or non-democracy? Which one is better? Citizenship, population density, of course, aging population, it turned out a very important uh, aspect, healthcare system. So there are different uh, you know, factors we should uh, consider uh, when we try to explain. And we don't have the right answer, but I think this is ongoing uh, research question to many practitioners as well as scholars. Next page. Well, I want to draw your attention to what Albright mentioned one point, why we have a lot of problems mismatch in challenges, ideas, and tools. And, and this is quotation from her. We are taking 21st century challenges, so the new problems that we are facing with, but we evaluate them with the 20th century ideas and responding with 19th century tools so that there are mismatches among the problems we should solve and ideas and institutions and then policy tools that we have. Next page. Well, COVID-19, of course, it's a wicked policy problem. So that in terms of problems, it's a very uh, difficult to solve as we all uh, we, we aware. Uh, next page. Particularly in terms of uh, uh, volatility, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, we call VUCA. So that the degree of volatility, uncertainty, ambiguity, and complexity is getting higher and higher so that it's uh, very difficult to solve the problem. And I think in COVID-19 actually has demonstrated uh, the, the level of the difficulties. Next page. So do institutional and legal arrangement matter? Of course, we have different uh, institutional arrangement, hierarchical, very centralized or hybrid and network decentralized. We don't know which one is better. And uh, Sabine uh, touched upon this issue and different countries been actually swing back and forth. Germany from decentralized and then centralized. And as she mentioned, you know, now it's the fifth stage. Well, I, I'm, I think it's a very important question, which one is better in the future? Next page. Uh, I had experienced uh, one former study for uh, the comparative study between uh, Korea and Japan. Actually, this is the one uh, part of the uh, uh, special issue which Sabin put together. Uh, so Korea and, and, and Japan, in fact, seemingly very uh, uh, similar, but it's a very different. Um, in Korea, we have, you know, Korean CDC, now it's agency level up, uh, upgraded. And then Japan, they don't have a uh, Korean version of uh, CD agency and they do have just a, a you know infectious disease uh, research institute so that there is not really good centralized uh, institutional arrangement responding to uh, COVID-19. I think that really uh, something that we can pay attention to. Well it does not mean that centralized format is always working better than decentralized form. So that's research question we had a chance to take a look at and next page. This is the uh, uh, vignette-based experiment research we, uh, uh, we put together in our institute. So we try to look at what are the uh, um, 
a better arrangement, institutional arrangement for routine uh, disaster and then non-routine disaster like COVID-19. And based on the uh, responses from uh, uh, more than 1,000 people uh, who participated in this uh, experiment and networked decentralized form is more preferred for non-routine disaster like COVID-19. Next page. And then we looked at uh, uh, some of the analysis a little bit uh, uh, in details, but you know, uh, basically this, I'll just uh, summarize the result. Uh, network governance, uh, basically the uh, network arrangement is pre preferred uh, uh, for non-routine disaster like a COVID-19. And then when it's a very, uh, uh, the severity of the disaster uh, is, is much higher, but when the urgency uh, is higher than then centralized uh, arrangement is preferred. So that I don't think there is a one right answer, but I think it's a very, really important uh, policy decision, which format we should, uh, we should take a look at, particularly uh, to promote both local optimization as well as global optimization. And I think mixed format would be, uh, uh, should be considered. Next. And then I'll just want to talk about uh, uh, values. Uh, I just want to get a quotation from uh, uh, Ejoni, the uh, sociologist, and a quotation, the world's most communitarian countries, maybe Korea is one of them, are handling uh, the pandemic well. The most individualistic countries are doing the worst. Well, you know, it's a, a little bit tricky, and also I think it's, a, it's a debatable, but I think, you know, there are individual liberalistic citizenship versus communitarian citizenship. Because of the nature of the pandemic, it's very contagious. So that communitarian citizenship is very, very important. And I think in some of the countries with a higher level of communitarian citizenship, they tend to be active in participating in MPIs, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, such as social distancing, uh, wearing masks, and et cetera. Next. And which is related to uh, co-production uh, and uh, you know, government and, uh, and citizens, they should work together. And as you all know, in particularly in Korean people uh, should know the mask app, apps, uh, mobile phone apps, it was developed using the uh, public data that's government released the data. And then group of citizens actually uh, 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 developed the app so that, you know, it was available to, uh, to, to the public for free. So that it's a really true sense of co-production between government and citizens. And also disaster, uh, emergency disaster uh, 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 support uh, fund, uh, which was uh, uh, paid uh, last year, May. Within 10 days, almost 90% of the uh, 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 payment was made. Well, it's a really challenging job because 22 million households in uh, 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 should be uh, uh, receiving the, the one, but not just by government, but working with eight credit card companies, as well as more than 9,000 bank uh, branch offices work together. So that if the government worked by itself, I don't think it, it, it was possible. So that working together is so uh, compelling. Next. Well, I, now I just want to talk a little bit about agility. Uh, I had a piece in a uh, public administration review about agility. Well, agility is not just uh, speed. If you Google uh, sprint training uh, images, and then you'll see this, starting first, running fast, and things like that. If you have agility training, next, you will have this. You should move here and there, zigzag, and then you need to deal with all the uh, uh, barriers and uh, hurdles and obstacles. So that agility, not only speed, but also flexibility. And I think in agility is really critical to uh, uh, effective mitigation of, uh, of COVID-19. And I think that will be important in the future as well. Next. But agility might hurt stability and then the, the work assignment to us is how you balance agility and stability. Next. 
Well, here, this is another uh, uh, research uh, uh, result. So we had a survey, uh, more than 1,000 people last year and this year. And they here, take a look at this one. Agility level goes up. And then among the three groups, high trust government group, and then low trust government and then medium. And here, the blue line, uh, low trust level of uh, people as government gets agile more and more, and then their anxiety on COVID-19 goes up so that low trust government people, they will be very nervous as government takes agile responses. But the people who trust the government, high trust group, as government agile more and more, and then their anxiety on COVID-19 goes down. So that it's very important under uncertain uh, uh, situations, but that picture will be is very different uh, this year. This year, regardless of the level of public trust in government, all the people goes up as government agile, agile, agile. What does it mean? Under uncertainty, agi agile response is very important, and then that works. Uh, uh, as far as government trust in government, but people in uh, uh, those people do not trust government, and then agility might hurt their confidence in government. So that there are some uh, relationship between public trust and agility and stability. Next, there are a lot of uh, policy responses, of course. And uh, uh, Sabine also mentioned that. Next. Coercive measures like a closing uh, schools, work, uh, public transportation closing, gathering res restrictions, travel restrictions, etc. So that some of the uh, uh, policy response is very restrictive, subsidies, monetary uh, support, economic measures, and then public information campaign. Different countries, of course, in a different uh, output, and I think that should be under uh, 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 continued research. Next, well, next, there are a lot of examples. Um, and uh, in Korea, I mentioned that there are UK examples. This is for your uh, information, so that there are some cases uh, you can take a look at. Next. UNDRR, making cities resilient, of course, you know, for uh, uh, disaster and crisis management. And then they also uh, take into consideration COVID-19 situation. And there are a lot of uh, 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 guidelines and examples. Next. So COVID-19, it's not solved yet. It's like a Tom and Jerry. And I think in local governments and central governments and international society, should work together until we terminate COVID-19. And my last, next, is this. Solving wicked problems, quotation from Einstein. Life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving, agile and resilient. Thank you. Thank you, Prophet Jay Moon. Uh, my colleague Jay Moon is very active domestically and internationally. And Jay, you presented well as usual. And we are always interested in your digital work, agile government issues. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Sabine, uh, I think you have uh, one question in Q&A window. Please check it out and prepare for it. Now, may I invite Ms. Erna Irawati from Jakarta, Indonesia. Erna? Thank you, Professor Pansukin. Uh, good afternoon and morning, ladies and gentlemen. It was a great and interesting presentation from Professor Sabian and Professor Jai Moon. Both of you address the importance of government, whether it is local or national governments, uh, to combat the pandemic COVID-19. We have the Una? central government. Am my voice is clear? Yes, it's okay now. Ah. 
That's good. Uh, in 20, when the government said COVID-19 has become a national, we are in NIPA, National Administration Responsibility. Our responsibility is to assure and ensure the effectiveness of the government training center all across Indonesia. So we assist more than we have national center, official local government training center, and more, more than uh, this provincial government training center has extension in local government. So meaning that there are big number of government training center in Indonesia. And when the pandemic happened, most of our government official training center conducted in-class training programs. So we have to reduce this face-to-face -face class training programs. And uh, we issued a policy at that time, we name it as distant learning. We do not choose e-learning because uh, we have different preparedness and readiness from this uh, local, especially for the local governments. 80% 80 80 uh, national government is ready transferring the in-class training program to the e-learning program. But for the local government, the story is very, very difficult. So we choose in the first stage, uh, we, we, we issued a guidance that this classical or in-class training program should be delivered using a distant learning programs approach at the first stage. While this uh, local government exercise in their own discretion, the meaning of the distant learning, some of them using e-learning, but some of them using like very, very classical method. For example, they are sending the module, they are sending the seminar kit using the, using like post, something like that, because they do not access to the technology and the training center uh, do not ready to use the e-learning programs. In the meantime, in our office, uh, take into account that the readiness of the local government training center is are not there. We designing like uh, uh, Prof. Prof. Sabin mentioned before is like centralization design. In NIPA, we, we built a single national system for pre-service training in the first states. So uh, this training, this pre-service training consists of four stages. The first one is self-learning. The second one is e-learning. The third one is experiential learning or working place learning. And the last one is classical one. To support this design, uh, in my office, we design uh, a massive open online course or we call it MOOC for self-learning. And also we design learning management system for the learning support for, from the approach. So we design two types of e-learning. The first one is MOOC for the self-learning and the second one is LMS for the e-learning one. The MOOC is designed and managed by our office in Jakarta. It's like centralized, uh, self-learning program, but the LMS, NIPA, our office design and develop the system, but the management and the operational is conducted by local government training center. So it's like uh, collaborating, collaborating between central government and local government uh, to ease the transition from the classical into the e-learning uh, process. We apply, applied this approach in 2021, but before this to be happen, we conducted like uh, assistance to the local government training center. We, uh, we did 
develop many channel of communication and also technical guidance to ease the, the, the transformation. And until last June, June uh, approximately 76,141 new entrants of the MOOC. And there are 94 government training center use the so it's a big success for us in terms of pre-service training programs. There are collaboration with between central government and local government. The system is a national system, it's a single system designed and built by the national government, but to be used by the local government training center because uh, before they, they do not have capacity to design this this uh, this this system so th that that is what we did uh, in terms of shifting the classical training program to the e-learning training programs in coping with COVID-19 pandemic and in the next stage right now we're designing in the same uh, scenario for the leadership training program for all across Indonesia but uh, we conducted a research last, last month. Uh, they asking for more classical training program because they said that this is leadership training program. So e-learning may be around 60%, but 40% they asking for the classical training program. So uh, a lesson learning from this one, uh, collaboration and flexibility are the key for the transformation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. That's from our Thank story. Much. Thank you very much, Anna Irwati. Uh, I hope Sabin, uh, you can uh, maybe respond to uh, Anna's uh, related comments later. Now, last but not least, may I invite Dr. Bach. Dr. Bach, floor is yours. Hi, I'm Dr. Hermit Bach. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank you for your insightful presentation, Professor Moon and Kurman. Uh, I'd like to share my uh, share some of my ideas based on your presentation and my research and my recent work. Uh, COVID uh, COVID nineteen is a wicked problem that cannot be solved by a single actor. COVID nineteen has had severe effect on every sector in the world. Citizens, private sector, non-profit sector, public sector, including both central and local government. Uh, most local governments are also facing a number of challenges, such as scarcity of resources, low financial independence, and lack of fiscal autonomy. In order to respond better, faster, fast challenges we encounter and improve e efficiency and organizational performance for sust sustainable development, I also think we need more agile and resilient governments. In addition, adaptive governance in the context of digital government, or as Dr. Kuman said, where new forms of collaborative governance are needed to rapidly adapt to changes in the internal and external environment. So I think a local government should collabor collaborate for joint service provision uh, to be more adaptive toward new technological and organizational changes and introduce innovative service. Uh, I, uh, I have some ideas in terms of autonomy. Uh, as Professor Kruman said, local government needs more autonomy. Uh, however, uh, most Korean local government lack of uh, autonomy. To be specific, first, uh, it is difficult to set the quota of public servants of the local government. Second, it is also difficult to form new organizations or agencies to deal with issues or social problems. So in order to adapt changes and overcome challenges such as COVID-19, uh, I think Korean central government should allow local government to be able to set the quota of public servants and form new 
organizations or agencies as, as well as fiscal autonomy. I also have some suggestions based on my research uh, to make agile and resilient government and digital transformation in the public sector. Local government need to make effort to encourage proactive uh, administration and cultivate an uh, environment where public servants can engage in innovative and risk-taking behavior. Uh, so typical examples of product of proactive administration and innovative, innovative behaviors are identifying new optimal solution, solutions to work process, not repeating old pro, pro, uh, practices, and taking initiatives to make improvement to unreasonable processes and regulations, uh, proposing new policies in congruence with social and technical changes, and uh, lastly, making extra effort to do more than was originally expected. Also, researchers point out that public servants are still regarded as passive and not innov innovative compared to employees in the private sector due to resistance to change, risk avoidance, and avoidance of responsibility. Uh, so, thus, uh, so local government should cultivate cl climate where public servants can engage in risk-taking behaviors without fear of failure. Uh, so in order to cultivate the risky-taking climate, it is recommended that local governments should not reprimand their employees as a result of minor errors or setbacks. In addition, it is important to omit any negative remarks during a performance evaluation or show any disadvantages to the employees regarding minor errors. Uh, so lastly, I want to say uh, we should make public servants more resilient as well as building a resilient and agile government. Uh, so resilience refers to the individual's capacity to cope successfully with the bounce back from significant change, uncertainty, failure, adversity, and increased responsibility. So in this uh, phase changing era, we need public servants who are really resilient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Park. Now uh, I want to open a Q&A session. Our first question raised by Dr. Pravin Maharjan uh, goes to Sabin. The question is as follows. What are the dimensions of digital government framework of government of Germany to localize the digital transformation. How does government reform public management at the local level? How does government build a digital public service putting citizens at the center during the COVID-19 and post COVID-19? Uh, Sabine, could you respond to this question? Uh, yes, thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, question. Uh, I, I would like to answer the question, uh, taking again the German example uh, and uh, the German experiences. Um, so we need to uh, take into account that, uh, as uh, I said in my presentation, the German system uh, of, of local governance is, is, is a very decentralized one with a high degree of autonomy. That means for administrative reforms and also for the digital transformation that uh, local governments have been first uh, in implementing these changes. So in Germany, we have the situation of a bottom up uh, development of uh, innovations of administrative reforms, including digital service delivery. So local governments were, have been first to implement respective changes. And then the changes have been upscaled to the state level, to the federal level and so on. Uh, so that, that's an important starting condition in, in the German context and in many decentralized countries such as Switzerland, the Nordic countries. You often have the local governments being first and being most innovative and being front run runners of reforms. Uh, and then uh, upper levels are taking over. So that's the kind of a logic, uh, which uh, I think contrasts with the more centralist countries such as France or 
even the United Kingdom. Um, and so what we what we have now in, in Germany concerning the digital transformation, also in the COVID-19 uh, or post-COVID era, is that we have some local solutions, digital services available, which are very, very different across the country. So we have a kind of, uh, uh, we have a multitude of solutions which sometimes are not compatible, which are which cannot connected, uh, cannot be connected to each other. Uh, and therefore now the federal government is trying to implement some more centralist measures to, to coordinate all these fragmented activities across the country. So we have these two developments of bottom-up development on the one hand with, with the local government and a fragmented landscape of digital solutions and now more and more centralist and federalist uh, interventions in order to coordinate to streamline, to, to, to unify all, all these uh, solutions. Um, and so just to mention one example, the, the online, we have a new law, the so-called Online Access Act, which is a federal law. And with, with this Online Access Act, the federal government tries to coordinate the process a little bit more. I hope this answers the question. Thank you, Sabine. Uh... I do see another question uh, for you. To what extent the Federal Digest Management Act give operational autonomy to local government during COVID-19 pandemic? Maybe you can think about this. And once I invited Jay, and later you may respond to this question if you can. Jay, I have a question on resilience uh, raised by Tommy Setiawan. There are things that are important for the state to pay attention to, namely local government resilience. However, resilience is a set of behaviors that stimulate social transformation and empower a group of people or social system. How should this resilience be built by central and the local government? Any thoughts, Jay? Well, uh, resilience means a lot, and in fact, depending on you know what specific aspects you want to focus on, uh, probably the interpretation of resilience might be very different. Uh, but however, uh, particularly crisis situations, resilience is very important. Uh, it's not it's not the one could it be secured by one particular actor, as uh, as uh, discussions that we had and presentations we had uh, is collaborative governance uh, should be and need to be a really fundamental foundation for resilience. Uh, here, uh, uh, probably uh, not only government per se, but also uh, particular pandemic situations, uh, the medical institutions, as well as in many countries, nonprofit organizations, their role is very, very critical. In fact, they could fill the, uh, uh, the gap that you know, uh, local and central governments often cannot, uh, cannot, uh, uh, cannot respond. And also citizens, uh, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation, so that it's really uh, you know, should be orchestrated together by different actors. And I think that's the uh, uh, prospects uh, that we uh, we can envision uh, for the uh, you know the good governance in in the pan, pan, in post pandemic era. And one thing I just want to uh, emphasize is also not only resilience. Uh, I think you know going back to the literature by Waldowski anticipation, so that anticipation and resilience, uh, I think would, both approaches should be taken advantage by, uh, particularly by government. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Sabine? Uh, well, I tried to respond to this question on uh, uh, the, the Federal Disaster Management Act, uh, to what extent it gives operational autonomy to uh, uh, local governments during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, well, we do not have a Federal Disaster Management Act, actually. Um, so what we have and what uh, the, the, all the uh, crisis management, the COVID-19 crisis management measures uh, have been based on is what we call the Federal Infection Protection Law. Uh, and this law on infection protection provides within the federal setting that exclusively the states and the local governments are responsible for containment measures. 
That means the Federation, the central government, has no means to impose containment measures to the subnational levels. So there's no mean by the Federal Minister of Interior or the Federal Minister of Health or the Chancellor to impose any kind of containment measures such as uh, uh, closure, shutdown, lockdown and so on on local governments. That is not possible. So it's a completely subnational uh, uh, issue and uh, states and local governments, even local governments, local health authorities can decide on their own discretion uh, on specific containment measures, on school closures and so on. So they are quite autonomous in this issue. And as I said in my presentation, this autonomy has to some extent been curbed over the course of the crisis. So there have now been some more centralist measures, some interventions also from the Federation to to amend the law, to change the law, to uh, introduce some new legislation in order to have a more centralist grip uh, on, on local governments. Thank you, Sabine. Uh, Professor Kim, can I add one? Yes, very briefly. Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, seminars that uh, Sabine and I uh, participated, an interesting comment from a uh, you know, Swedish colleague. And in fact, you know, when the COVID-19 uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, outbroken, and then actually the, the law the Swedish government applied was not Infect, uh, in, uh, infectious Disease Act, uh, because it's uh, really controlled by the, centr uh, the uh, local government, so that in you know, the central government they cannot do anything. So that the law they applied is not Infectious Disease Law, but Public Safety Act. So that you know, depending on the uh, institutional and legal arrangement, the responses will be very different. Okay, thank you, Jay. I think we had exceptionally good presentation and discussion as well as uh, uh, limited but quite interactive Q&A session. Many thanks go to Professor Sabin Kulman, my colleague Jay Moon, as well as Madam Ona Irawati in Indonesia and Dr. Hyunuk Bag in Kerala. Particularly, I'd like to express my heartfelt appreciation to uh, Sabin Kulman. Sabin, I think this is a good start to collaborate between German and the Korean PA communities. I hope this kind of collaboration could be continued over the years, all right? And according to the world of matters as of today, 185 million people have been infected and 4 million people lost their lives around the world. But the good news is that uh, several kinds of uh, effective, effective vaccines are available so that I strongly believe that we can overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. This too shall pass. Once again, thank you very much for your participation and I hope to see you some other time. Now I'd like to turn over microphone to Ms. Megan Park, who is the moderator of the second session. Ms. Park, are you there? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim, for your introduction. Welcome to session two of UNDESA CRILA Forum on Accelerating Digital Transformation of uh, Local Government. My name is Lee Kyung Park. I'm Governance and Public Administration Officer at UNPOG, DPID to UNDESA. And it is my uh, great pleasure to be the moderator of this session today. Uh, as was also highlighted during the uh, opening remarks and the session one, ICT and digital technologies have been playing a critical role in uh, the COVID-19 response, particularly uh, in empowering uh, local governments to deliver emergency assistance and essential, essential services uh, to the citizens at the local level. And digital, digitalization has become the heart uh, of uh, preparation for the new normal uh, in the post-COVID-19 era with an exponential demand for uh, digital services and so-called non transformation at the local level and share different country city experiences and cases. 
And for this session, we'll have five distinguished speakers, four presenters, respectively from DPIDG Yoandesa, Wellington City Council of New Zealand, Lao PDR and the Philippines, and one discussion from the World Bank. After the presentations and discussions, we'll have a Q&A discussion. So I, I would like to invite all participants to actively share your questions, ideas to the speakers uh, in the Zoom, uh, Zoom Q&A box. Yes. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter, my colleague, Mr. Denis Suzar, Governance and Public Administration Officer at Digital Government Branch of DPIDG UN DESA. He will introduce the local online service index, LOSI, from the UN e-government survey. Mr. Suzar, you have the floor. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Denis Susar. I work in the digital government branch uh, of the UN uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, please allow me to thank uh, President Mr. Il J. Kim, Korea Research Institute for Local Administration, and uh, Mr. Bo Kim Shim, head of AMPOC, uh, for putting this conference and bringing us uh, all in the virtual uh, world together. So, I will briefly introduce the local online service index. Uh, we've started this index in 2018 uh, uh, as a pilot uh, as a pilot project. Uh, at that time, uh, we we have looked at uh, around 40 uh, 40 cities uh, and uh, checked how they are assessing uh, how they are uh, providing public services online. And the motivation was uh, we've we've heard we've heard uh, a lot today. So people are closer to municipalities more than national federal government, uh, and we haven't seen many assessment levels at the local level. Uh, and the goal is uh, help cities measure track measure their progress and also learn from each other. Next slide, please. So you may be familiar with the United Nations e-government survey. Uh, briefly, uh, with that survey, we looked at, we look at 193 countries uh, and their digital co government portals. And we come up with an index called e-government development index. So that's at the national level. Uh, local online service index uh, is the index that uh, that mimics the e-government development index at the local level. It has four uh, main uh, area: content, uh, service, uh, participation and engagement, and technology. Uh, the same way uh, we assess national portals, each city portal uh, is assessed by at least two researchers in a blind way. Uh, that that means they don't know each other uh, unless we get the results. And if there are any discrepancies, uh, we connect the researchers and, and we try to resolve the discrepancies. Next slide, please. Uh, in the upcoming uh, 2022 survey, uh, we will be looking at uh, 193 most uh, populous cities uh, from each UN member state. Uh, of course, there, there, there are going to be some uh, exceptions. We have some uh, city states such as Singapore, Monaco, and there are also small island developing states, uh, which uh, will be difficult to uh, pick uh, the largest city. Uh, but the goal is uh, in the upcoming survey uh, to look at all uh, 193 uh, countries and the largest city in each country, largest city in population. You can look at the results uh, from the 2020 survey in chapter four. Next slide, please. I mean, basically, br uh, briefly, uh, these are from uh, 2020 uh, edition. Uh, so uh, cities are ranked according to their uh, losses score here. Uh, I have to say that uh, among the cities in the top 10, and uh, there, there is really, uh, they are really close to each other. There is not much difference. A few features identify uh, uh, the, the first ranks. Next, please. So here, uh, 
the, the slides is not uh, fully displayed, but here uh, the Y axis is showing the on the right side of sign, uh, right side of the picture in the graph. The, the Y axis is showing the local online service index and the X axis is showing the online service index. So as you see, in most uh, cases, the X, the X, the X axis is uh, larger. That means national portals are doing better than uh, city portals. But in a few cases, such as Madrid, Berlin, uh, Brussels, uh, we see that city portal is actually doing better, better uh, than, uh, than the national counterpart. Next, please. So uh, I'll just conclude with some findings. Uh, First of all, uh, one finding is uh, if the performance of city local government portal doesn't usually match that of its country, and as I tried to explain in the previous slide, and the average index for all uh, cities is 0 0.43, which means uh, there are lots of features uh, city portals need to implement. Uh, income level, uh, I mean, there is some kind of correlation, but uh, not that much. Uh, among the four uh, areas that I mentioned, the content provision criterion is the highest addressed by the city portals. Uh, that means there, there are, we, we've, we've noted a lot of content in the city portals. Uh, next slide, please. But the service provision uh, scored the lowest. Uh, again, this tells us that uh, there is room for improvement, especially for providing services in the, in the city portals. Uh, I think more than half of the cities had implemented only 21% of the service uh, services we check. Uh, majority of city portals don't meet various technology standards. Uh, that's something uh, we noted. Uh, majority of city portals depend heavily on various social media networks, uh, which in my view is a good thing. They are, uh, they are using the platforms where people already uh, are using. Uh, so they are going to, uh, going to the places uh, where people already interact and tapping into those existing platforms. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I mean, these are uh, these findings also call for the establishment of a shared vision for locally government projects. I, I want to highlight particularly small and medium enterprises here. I think it's important to include them in the locally government uh, projects, and the same way national uh, governments uh, project nationally government projects must be people driven. Uh, same applies for locally government like we have to hear from people uh, what they say what they would like to view uh, in their uh, online in the, in the in their uh, municipality portals let me let me conclude by saying that uh, the assessment for the 2022 survey is happening in the coming months uh, and we will be launching the UNA government survey uh, early early next year and I'll be very happy to respond to any questions later about the local online service index. Uh, thank you, Ms. Park, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Penisar, for uh, your very insightful presentation, introducing Lucy uh, and sharing uh, the main findings. Uh, I also fully agree with you on the importance of uh, establishing a shared vision uh, on local e-government projects by uh, involving all relevant stakeholders. and. Um, uh, making it people driven, uh, also particularly by uh, ensuring living no one behind. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to invite the second presenter, Mr. Sean O'Day, uh, City Innovation Lead of Wellington City Council, to introduce the experiences of Wellington uh, in accelerating digital transformation. Mr. O'Day, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, uh, I believe there's a slideshow. Excellent. So if we go to the next slide. Hello, my name's Sean Ordain. I'm the City Innovation Lead for the City of Wellington in New Zealand. We're the capital city uh, and we're the core of a region of about half a million people. There's not a lot of New Zealanders in the world. Uh, our experience with COVID has been fairly unique amongst nations. Uh, each time the disease has threatened us, we have managed to eliminate it. Uh, we've just completed that for the third time now. And the reason we could do this is a highly integrated local and central government relationship that 
has very trusted institutions that can mobilize a population very quickly. And one of the things that underpins this is a, quite an agile digital capability. So for example, what you're seeing there are two operational dashboards that are used every day in the city. One, the one on the left uh, takes data from our NGO partners and uses that to make sure that those partners are given the resources they need to make sure that people are fed, that people are cared for, and they have the resources they need should the city go into lockdown. That allows them to scale up very quickly and down again very quickly and make sure that the city meets its uh, transparency requirements. On the right is information coming from the combined uh, government data sources. What that's doing is pulling data from the Ministry of Health and across the government into the local context and telling us where our environment uh, amplifies threats, where it mitigates threats, and what an infection in a particular place would mean and the best strategies for getting rid of it. So if we move to the next slide, some of these uh, strategies have also involved uh, experimenting with things like contact tracing. So contact tracing is the responsibility of the central government, but it is the responsibility of the cities to amplify the effect of it. So on the left is Ripple. Ripple was a locally produced app here in the city that we adopted as a whole of city solution uh, in advance of the government releasing its digital contact tracing solution. What was interesting about this is it kept the data with the person. Uh, it created the logs required by contact tracers uh, on the device. And uh, because we had used our health information standards, it could transition across to being uh, the central government uh, system very easily. Uh, once that transition had occurred, we then began to scale back our Ripple deployment, and then we used it to experiment with concepts like indigenous data sovereignty and to move into areas where the adoption of the government app was not working so well. So if we move to the next slide, where this then meant, what this meant was because we controlled the health problem very quickly, we could very swiftly move on to the economic issues caused by COVID. So what you're seeing here is a very simple map of the city's main shopping streets that color codes all of the different uses of those streets. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, for each street, it'll tell you if it's a hospitality business, if it's a, a retail business, an office, travel agent. What this meant was we could look at a, the evolving vacancy rates within the city to understand how our economy was adapting. And we could also compare that with the causes, causes of vacancies. Many of them were not COVID, they were to do with engineering works and earthquake strengthening and other resilience programs. What this meant was we could understand the trends that COVID was accelerating. So for example, bank branches were closing and retreating because most New Zealanders don't use cash anymore. Uh, the government have just begun consultation about whether we're actually happy to pay a, a special tax to, to keep cash in circulation. Uh, this was really important information for the city when it came to solving some of these problems. So if we look at the next slide, you'll see um, we decided we'd hold a, um, a series of festivals once it was safe to begin to pull people back into the city and to help shift the city from being transaction-based to experience-based because we could see that transactional-based businesses were suffering much more than experience-based ones. This uh, tactic succeeded beyond our wildest dreams to the point where we held a street party and 150,000 people turned up, which is quite a lot in a city of our size. And if you move to the next slide, uh, it also meant to targeted support to local businesses. So by analyzing uh, expenditure patterns and uh, movement data from across the city, we could work out where local artisan shops uh, could access new catchments uh, of customers. And so what we did is we uh, incentivized them to go into empty shops uh, in groups to do that uh, and help spread that authentic Wellington brand. And if we move to the next slide, uh, we also realized that our art sector was taking quite a hit. Uh, Wellington is the cultural capital of New Zealand. So what we said is we would use this information to target 500 artist performances throughout the city to turn the city essentially into a theater. Not only did that help sustain our artists, but it also helps uh, meet those wider goals. And if we move to the next slide, what you ended up with is this essentially, uh, a, a digital twin of the city that was being used by many, many different departments to take simultaneous action, unified by that data footprint. 
uh, and that ability to act in parallel rather than series meant that we could act very quickly. We could deal with the very short planning horizons that COVID had, and we could deal with some of those problems of trying to predict the unpredictable. If you move fast enough, the need to predict suddenly uh, becomes slightly less pressing. And if we move to the next slide, uh, this has then propelled us into new areas. So for example, that digital twin of the city now looks like this. Uh, it's an entirely interactive three-dimensional model. We no longer use it in VR, instead we use it on very large screens. Uh, and what that's doing is it's showing people the stuff they can't see, what economic flows look like, what does the future of the city look like, how are we going to invest six and a half billion dollars in a mass transit system or, a, uh, or in our water network. Uh, and that's underpinned new business models. So for example, this is being done with a whole series of local and international companies and funded in some quite innovative ways. And if you move to the next slide, uh, it's also helping with experiments such as this. So this is our rules as code experiment. So what we have been doing is encoding the city's rules and regulations directly into machine executable form. What this is doing is underpinning a new generation of public services. Uh, which are much more intuitive uh, and also help ease the administrative burden on the city. It's only a proof of concept, but we see great promise in it, particularly in our planning system. And if you move to the next slide, uh, one of the other things we've been doing is taking this data and instead of using it to predict uh, what is going to happen and to try and project from what is frankly an extremely disturbed pattern, We've been using it to understand shifts in the way that the city interacts with people and changes to things like how people spend their time. Uh, what does home commuting look like in a post-pandemic world? Uh, I can tell you it, it looks like about a 20% reduction in the daytime occupancy of a city spread across a week. Uh, it can also help us position for the shift we are actually aiming for. Act, which is not how do we get to a post-COVID world, but how do we get to a post-climate change world? And how can we use the strengths we've learned in that pandemic to drive that transition? And if you move to the next slide, um, I'll say thank you very much. Um, thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Dane, for your uh, very insightful presentation, sharing the experience uh, of Wellington in harnessing digital technologies and, and data. Uh, for effective and integrated uh, COVID-19 emergency response and also understanding the impact uh, uh, on the local economy and local businesses, as well as also sharing the directions for future shifts uh, in the post-COVID-19 era. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to invite our next uh, presenter, Dr. Tavisa Manodam, Director General of E-Government Center, Ministry of Technology and Communications of Rao PDR to introduce Rao PDR's experience in promoting digital transformation. Uh, Dr. Banudam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Park. So I would like to share uh, the experience of Laos. Uh, we are developed uh, many things during this time to, to fight with the COVID. So I would like to firstly uh, introduce about the basic infrastructure ICT in Laos. And also I will move to the plan that we are planning to do the Laos digital transformation. And I will fo I mainly focus on the e-government, uh, what we are doing uh, to, to turn on to the digital government. And finally, I will show some future plan. Next, please. Next. Next. Okay. So in Laos, uh, for the infrastructure, we, we have four operators. And for the internet infrastructure, we cover a uh, whole country recently. And for 3G, it's likely 80% already. And 4G is uh, now is, is, is around half. And 5G, we just started. Next. So refer to the statistic uh, on early this year, uh, show that more than half of population in Laos already can access to the internet and uh, very, very interesting that all of them can access to the social media, like a Facebook, YouTube, etc. Next. Next. So uh, for the large digital transformation, we already have the vision and strategy uh, to, to move forward and using the ICT to, to support on this. Next. 
So this is the draft uh, strategy of the digital transformation in Laos. We also separate into the digital government, digital economy, uh, digital livelihood, and also digital society. Next. So uh, regarding to the policy and regulation also, we, we have many uh, law and also act to support the use of the ICT. For example, the law of the telecommunication, law of the uh, ICT, cybercrime, e-transaction, or even uh, we already have the law on the digital signature. Next. So in Laos, also similar to another country in, in the region, we also have many, many uh, digital services, uh, including the, uh, the bank service, payment, next. And so the uh, logistic and also uh, transportation and health also we also have. Next, please. Uh, this is a uh, healthcare that we, uh, last two days, we just, uh, open what we call Lao KYC to uh, to treat the people to uh, to for the COVID treating. So this is a very very news in Laos, and we are now trying to promote this uh, application Lao KYC for Laos people to use, and then we can monitoring who who get the effect from the uh, COVID nineteen and how we can we can treat on that. Uh, next, please. Uh, so I will uh, mainly focus on this topic, uh, e-government. Next. So uh, Ministry of Technology and Communication, this is a uh, quite new technology that merged uh, between the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication in the past with the Ministry of Science and Technology. So the new tech, uh, ministry is named uh, Ministry of Technology and Communication. So what we are uh, respond for is uh, we are taking care of the government network, also the spectrum, uh, e-signature, CA, cybersecurity, and also e-government is a part of this uh, uh, ministry. Next. So regarding to the vision and strategy that I mentioned before, so e-government also one of the strategy that you can see uh, on the strategy six. So the government are focusing on how to improve the e-government and to boost the economy in Laos and try to use the new technology in the uh, government, uh, government work. Next. So this is the draft of the uh, e-government master plan. Actually, this morning, we, we just uh, have the kick-off meeting that we are working with the UNDP uh, to support us on the uh, digital government development project in Laos. So in, in this project, we are trying to uh, study and make the digital government master plan and also the, the standardization of the e-government. So uh, this is a draft that we are focusing on at the moment. So you can see that we are also focusing on the uh, policy and regulation as a main of uh, our, our point. And also human resource development is also very important for, for Laos for, uh, to, to develop uh, government to the digital. Next. So uh, up to now, we already have many, many services to provide to the government and also to the uh, uh, last people. In the government part, we also have the government network, government crowd, also the uh, government portal. We also have the e-office, this application, and email, video conference, G-chat, G-share, and website for the government to use. Actually, uh, we, we developed this kind of service uh, five of, uh, four or five years already, but uh, just used during uh, since last year that COVID come. So many government sector using our service. Uh, next, please. 
Also for the last people, we also have the e-health, e-education, e-banking, e-disaster. This is what we are already provide to to last people at the moment. Next. So the feature plan. Next, please. <laughs> As you can see, uh, we already have many many service to to the uh, government and also to the last people. But what we we see the problem now, many many government sector they have the information, they have the database, but uh, they didn't share to each other yet. So what we we are trying to do now, we try to create the uh, government data exchange to share information from uh, every ministry like a Ministry of Finance or Ministry of uh, Health, etc. So after we, we can share the information, then we can provide more service and uh, provide better service to, to the customer as well. Next, please. So this is our future plan. We are trying to uh, do the new policy and regulation, uh, Digital Government Act, master plan, standardization, and also another service for, for the people in government. Next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Monandam, for your uh, presentation, introducing the digital transformation strategy of low PDR and also uh, uh, diverse e-government services, and also sharing the future plan uh, in digital government development in your country. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to invite our next uh, presenter, Ms. Aida Yuvianko, Director at the Department of Information and Communications Technology of the Philippines to share the Philippines experience. She's also uh, the Project Director at the Land Transportation Office, Land Transportation Management System. Ms. Uh, Yuvianko, you have the floor. Uh, Ms. Yuvianko, you're muted, so could you turn on your audio, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miku. So uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. I thank you and I thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this event. So um, I'll start with my presentation. Uh, next, um, next slide, please. Okay, the Philippines has long since been recognized the information and communications technology is essential in the social and economic life of Filipinos. The 1987 Constitu Philippine Constitution states that communications and information plays a vital role in nation building. The National Computer Center at the time took the lead in formulating the first national government system plan for government. And there were several national ICT plans crafted through the years. And the latest is the EGMP or the e-government master plan of 2022. Uh, all of these plans show that the Philippines embraces digital transformation and envisions to be a digitally transformed government, providing responsive and timely services to its citizens in the most efficient and transparent manner with, and with accountability. Several legislations were also enacted to promote and support ICT, especially the business and financial sector, while ensuring protection to individuals' privacy and preventing cyber crimes. In 2015, the law creating the Department of Information and Communications Technology, or DICT, was enacted. DICT has the mandate of ensuring universal access to quality, quality affordable, reliable, and secure ICT services. Next slide, please. This is the digital transformation framework for local government units that we have established. The four quadrants represent the most critical attributes that each LGU should have. Citizen-centric services, excellent fiscal management, effective law enforcement, and informed decision-making, policy formulation, and legislation. Okay, so the rectangles attached to each quadrant list down the expected outcomes of having the respective attributes. Uh, the listing here of the outcomes are not really uh, exhaustive yet. Uh, many more can be added to this. Okay, next slide, please. This slide shows the ELGU capability framework le level one. This represents a functional structure of the LGU and is not meant to represent the organizational structure. The row of boxes in the middle 
are the defined functions that need to be supported by ICT to enable digital transformation. The long rectangles below and above the boxes are the LGU attributes or characteristics that we want ICT to contribute in achieving. Slide, next slide, please. This slide shows the LGU capability level two framework. It links capabilities to the applications or ICT interventions that support the achievement of the desired attributes and outcomes that we desire. This is not an exhaustive list of application systems, but just a list of the most common ones. This capability framework guide us in assessing the performance of each LGU in terms of digital transformation. A good score in this area would be critical in their being awarded the seal of good governance. Next slide, please. This slide and the next list down the various strategies and initiatives of the government led by the ICT in accelerating digital transformation at the local level. So at the DICT, we have a bureau whose main objective is to develop ICT in the countryside. It organizes fora together with the Department of Trade and Industry to link up startup ICT companies with investors. Okay, it also supports the local ICT councils and um, cap capacity building at the local level. It promotes ICT in innovations in LGUs through an annual awards program for LGU ICT projects. Okay, but the ICT also provides for free and integrated business permits and licensing system to third, fourth, and fifth class municipalities because these municipalities wouldn't really have the budget to implement uh, digital transformation. Through the central business portal of the DICT, the EBBLS of LGUs are linked to the Philippine Business Database to facilitate evaluation and approvals of business permits. Next slide, please. Establishment of technology hubs for ICT training and use of local businesses provision of a common platform for website development and establishing design standards to facilitate consolidation of data from the ground up. Provision of ICT training programs for LGU officials and staff and provision of internet service in areas that are not serviced by commercial telcos through the national broadband program and the free Wi-Fi program of the ICT. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this um, slide shows where the LGUs at the moment are having more achievements. So those in violet colors are where they are, they have more uh, ICT interventions implemented. So those in green are the ones left behind. So you see that uh, we are poor, uh, we, are rank, we rank uh, very low in terms of uh, database management of citizens. So citizen registry, that's why we have a, a hard time in this time of COVID pandemic in, in terms of uh, contact tracing and uh, benefits administration. Next slide, please. So the, the challenges also that the LGUs encounter are, would be availability of internet service connection in, in the non-urban areas, availability of ICT experts as this ICT practitioners would seek employment in the private sector because of better pay, availability of good ICT training programs in the countryside, and priorities. And another challenge would be priorities of LGU officials and the political will to implement reforms that would be brought about through ICT interventions. Next slide, please. So um, the impact of COVID-19 to the digital transformation is mostly positive. So it hastened the implementation of ICT in the local government units and uh, the, necessity, the necessity to follow health protocols and extensive lockdowns for them to avail and use ICTs in various aspects of governance. The very high usage of social media by Filipinos helped LGUs in using ICT for citizen surveys, reporting and feedback, as well as promoting LGU COVID-19 announcements, policies, and protocols. ICT professionals and ICT companies have more opportunities to develop applications for the needs of the constituents and LGUs. Next slide, please. End of presentation. Thank you.
That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Yovienko, for your very insightful uh, presentation, uh, introducing the local uh, government digital transformation framework and strategies of the Philippines, uh, as well as the impact of COVID-19 um, digital transformation. I particularly uh, noted uh, the, uh, the emphasis on the citizen engagement and interaction uh, mentioned in the uh, EELGU capability uh, framework level and also the diverse support uh, the DICT as a national government ministry provides to local governments and, and local uh, ICT councils. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, I would like to invite our discussion of the session, Dr. Jackie Kari, Senior Digital Development Specialist, uh, Digital Development Global Practice of the World Bank to provide his comments on the four presentations uh, of this session and share his analysis and insights on the discussion of the session. Dr. Kari, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Park, uh, for the opportunity to comment, but also to uh, try really to read between uh, the different presentation of this uh, interesting uh, uh, session. And uh, at the end, I will try really to connect uh, uh, what we came with, uh, with the first session that uh, uh, we had. So uh, uh, let's, let's try really to see what, uh, what did we learn uh, so far. Uh, there are two major uh, things that are very uh, uh, general across the three presentation from the three very different, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, countries in terms of digital maturity uh, and also the umbrella, uh, let's say, intervention uh, that uh, was done by uh, uh, Dennis. Uh, the first one is that uh, there is a uh, there is a high probability, high probability that uh, I would say no national or subnational or even city government right now that uh, is not realizing the value and potential of digital transformation. Uh, basically, because uh, there is a need uh, to make services more efficient, uh, grow the economy, uh, had. Uh, also uh, push digital transformation in order really to address uh, the, the, the crisis itself, or even uh, to push for an accelerated recovery of the, the crisis. In the same time, uh, we already heard uh, uh, for uh, Ms. Haida, for example, some of the challenges uh, that are facing uh, the local level. In terms of, uh, I would say, I would like to focus here on, on the progress that is happening between the national and subnational level in terms of, uh, um, I would say, uh, usually it's not easy in terms of uh, uh, a local mandate uh, for collaboration and institutional SLAs that are already established, uh, uh, some data sharing uh, protocols that already been uh, there. Uh, we, 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 we are not seeing them uh, so far. Uh, in the example of Lao, for example, uh, that wasn't really the focus of the presentation. In Philippines, uh, th there is uh, uh, definitely some push, but uh, it's not yet, uh, uh, let's say, uh, seen. And it's, uh, it's very highly in terms of uh, focus on, on data sharing uh, when it is coming uh, to the example in uh, uh, New Zealand by Sean. Uh, th there is another thing is that, uh, um, that we are also aware of is that uh, digital innovation move uh, uh, the speed of light uh, right now. And some of the municipalities and city uh, and local uh, governments are struggling in order really to cope with such kind of speed. I'm talking here mainly about, let's say, uh, the tech and services procurement, uh, the talent development, but also the agility uh, that has been discussed uh, in a comprehensive way uh, during the first session in terms of adaptation uh, of, uh, of the national plans. Uh, and how it is percolated uh, uh, on the national level. So th those are the, the let's say, uh, what, uh, what we are reading diagonally across uh, the different presentation. So what are we observing in terms of uh, uh, practices uh, uh, so far beyond what we saw in, in the presentation? Uh, uh, one is, it's, uh, again, uh, I know it's a, it, it, it shouldn't be a stereotype, but uh, it's obvious that when there is a political support, there is a leadership uh, uh, a champion, uh, things are at the highest level, things are, are really pushed uh, uh, very strongly. We are seeing uh, even outside of uh, what is happening uh, in Asia, 
uh, a country uh, like uh, Egypt that uh, just in, in nine months has decentralized completely the healthcare services among the different governorates. Uh, we are seeing uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, uh, in just uh, uh, four days, uh, 6.3 million uh, students have been shifted uh, towards, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a hybrid learning uh, uh, format. Uh, those are examples that are showing that when, when there is a, a will and the leadership, uh, things can happen. Uh, there is also another point, which is uh, uh, the, the countries and even on the local level, when there is investment in digital infrastructure, and talents uh, uh, for, for many years before the crisis, things were much, much easier. And, uh, and uh, those are where the key foundations to build on uh, easily in terms of, let's say, shifting uh, or uh, uh, securing business continuity uh, and also building on it uh, for the next phase of recovery. Uh, there is a third one, uh, which is uh, basically, uh, it's, uh, it's now, uh, let's say, has been demonstrated uh, that uh, at the local level, when we are talking about digital transformation, it's beyond just the department uh, of uh, I ICT or, uh, or even the, the unit that is responsible for the digital uh, right now. There is a lot of interaction. Uh, I mentioned the example of, uh, of uh, shifting, uh, uh, let's say, the to uh, e-learning, uh, so you really need to interact with different line ministries uh, uh, on, on a regular basis, uh, uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, there is already continuity, uh, that uh, uh, it's not anymore uh, a technology focus, but rather it's a people-centered uh, uh, approach. And finally, my fourth and last point is, uh, is basically about, uh, uh, it has been uh, hammered since uh, the beginning of, uh, of our discussion this morning or this afternoon uh, and uh, continued, it's, a, it's always a multi-stakeholder approach where participation of different uh, uh, stakeholders are key. It's beyond just uh, uh, government, uh, it's, uh, it's where private sector has a role, uh, where uh, citizens uh, are uh, coming uh, with, uh, with strong contribution, not just being informed or having access to information, but uh, shaping such kind of the design of uh, some of the services. This will require a trade-off, uh, a trade-off uh, from different uh, stakeholders, which we didn't touch base on uh, uh, heavily uh, yet. So with this, uh, where are we heading? Uh, or let's say, what can we uh, uh, take it to the next level uh, when it is coming to uh, the trends? There is. Uh, let me highlight uh, some of the biggest trends, uh, very few of them, but uh, uh, very critical to the next phase of accelerating uh, digital transformation within the local uh, uh, government or the local level. One is that uh, uh, cloud 5G uh, are transforming and will transform uh, uh, government uh, in terms of uh, the digital infrastructure. While they are not yet mainstream, cloud of course more, but 5G are, are heading towards uh, uh, mainstreaming more and more, and we'll see more of it, uh, is that uh, it's, it's unbelievable the, the, the capabilities for uh, uh, the transaction of, uh, of data and data sharing uh, capabilities that uh, uh, such kind of infrastructure are allowing in terms of just uh, uh, the flow, securing the flow of data, but also the processing of the data where emerging technology can come and add value, uh, augmenting, let's say, the personalization of uh, such kind of uh, services. Just to give you some numbers, uh, when we are talking about, uh, a lot of people are not realizing that uh, uh, with 4G, you can do magic, uh, uh, but because uh, uh, the download speed is uh, five to 12 uh, megabyte per second. But uh, uh, try to imagine what can you do with the, when the 5G is allowing you a hundred times faster with 10 gigabytes per second uh, instead. Uh, I'm focusing here, as you can see, on data because that will be the future of how the local government can function and can interact, complement, uh, let's say, by giving a, a full experience to the citizen and businesses 
when it is coming uh, uh, to their interaction between national and local uh, level. There is an, a second, uh, uh, let's say, uh, issue, which I'm surprised that it hasn't been highlighted so far, which is uh, with more digital transformation, there is a risk and this risk needs to be managed. It's not just data uh, uh, privacy that, uh, and uh, the protection that uh, we need to take, but also protection has a, a security aspect. So cybersecurity is becoming uh, more important than ever, uh, uh, not just because of the uh, explosive surge of uh, the number of, uh, of hacking uh, on critical infrastructure, especially, which is uh, freezing completely uh, the, the uh, I would say the, 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 the push of services uh, and the delivery of services, but also it's affecting the livelihood of, uh, of different uh, uh, people. And that's what we really care uh, uh, the most here. And finally, uh, I would like to highlight is that, uh, um, and this is the, uh, most probably where uh, um, I would like to push the bar a little bit uh, for Dennis to think about uh, beyond service delivery and the transactional, uh, let's say, uh, uh, aspect that uh, we are seeing so far, because uh, the future will be like uh, has been happened, or let's say been highlighted quite well, which is uh, uh, it's omni-channel, omni-channel uh, uh, that uh, is with different channels. It's not just because of uh, there is a, a gateway or uh, a portal. Uh, that, uh, that that's the only way in order to deliver the services. So we are moving more and more toward an ecosystem approach, an ecosystem with different channels, but it is driven by the data flows that are happening uh, between the different uh, entities, between the different services, and between the different, uh, uh, I would say, um, levels of government. And this was, will allow us in order really to have uh, more opportunities uh, for uh, 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 private sector jobs to be created uh, because they, they will be part of the service uh, provision will be through private sector, but also it will be also uh, a, a more uh, uh, predictive uh, in terms of services and personalized in the same time where uh, within this ecosystem, there is an interoperability, uh, uh, let's say aspect that is critical so the data can flow uh, back and forth. So let me end by two things. One is that accelerating the digital transformation and the propelling that happened uh, because of uh, the COVID is giving us a great opportunity. The opportunity is not in terms of the technology. It's, uh, it's really about uh, rethinking and reconstructing the social contract. It's, uh, it's where really it can uh, bring more trust in the government and allowing more transparency and accountability because the tools are there. So we are not really uh, escaping from uh, uh, delivering on them. And that's the link with the first uh, uh, session. The second point that I would like to end uh, with is that uh, when it is coming really to uh, uh, a call for, uh, for let's think together, uh, do I need really to uh, zoom into the local uh, aspect without separately uh, taking the national aspect, which means that what is uh, within the EGDI, should I really uh, think about merging uh, the pilot of LOCI within the OCI? It has been debated uh, uh, a lot, uh, but, uh, but still no decision has been there. I see that there is a lot of interaction going on between the local and national level, and that is at a certain time, this can be coming uh, uh, in one ecosystem that will allow us in order to serve better the citizen and businesses. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kari, for your insightful analysis uh, on the key points of the presentations, uh, as well as the challenges and opportunities for accelerating digital transformation at the local level and uh, major policy considerations uh, that you shared with us that are uh, very essential with a particular emphasis on, on data. Thank you very much. Now uh, we have some, line, some time left for Q&A discussions to address some of the questions received from our participants. Uh, we have received some questions uh, uh, both through the Q&A box uh, during the session as well as uh, through the pre-registration -re questions. 
Uh, first, uh, may I invite uh, Mr. Sean Odin um, to, uh, to answer the question? I saw that he shared his ideas through the Q&A box, but I think maybe he could uh, share it uh, with all, all other participants to the question uh, shared by Ms. Milinani Fariantini. What are the main challenges uh, for a New Zealand government to respond to the identified ships uh, that you uh, mentioned in the, your presentation and uh, how to make effective policy uh, for supporting the matters? If you could uh, briefly answer to this question, that will be appreciated. Ms. Alden? Absolutely. Yeah. The, so the primary difficulties are in understanding the patterns that are emerging. So that means deploying things like uh, machine learning, uh, the Internet of Things into the environment to understand what the pattern of life is within our cities and within our society, and then changing the pattern of government to support that. Uh, alongside that, things like that rules as code uh, trial I outlined, that sets the stage for uh, the automation of government and the augmentation of public service uh, staff uh, with machine abilities. Those allow things like far greater auditing uh, and transparency of processes, uh, allow much more efficient and effective processes to take place. Uh, but that then needs to take place uh, inside some much larger policy inquiries. So for example, uh, what, what is our position on digital identity and how is that to be done? Uh, what does what do indigenous rights look like as they're translated into these computer systems? And also how do we set the scene so that our digital investment we make today doesn't become the digital debt of tomorrow? Because as government functions become more digitized in my experience, they begin to converge and the functional structures of government then need to change with that convergence. Okay, thank you very much for, uh for uh, your answer. Next, we have an, uh, received another question through the Q&A box uh, from a participant. This one is to Ms. Yuvianko uh, uh, from the Philippines. Uh, uh, are there any measures to ensure an evidence-based governance? As uh, of this uh, moment, there are no central network for contact tracing. The data reporting of the OH uh, for uh, COVID cases is always delayed. What is your office's role to ensure that the information dissemination for the uh, constituents uh, is best and with integrity. Could you uh, briefly answer to this uh, question, please, uh, Ms. Yavienko? Thank you. Yeah, um, right now, um, the most headway that we have achieved, or the ICT has achieved. Ms. Yavienko, could you unmute, please, yes. Yeah. The most sad way that we have achieved in terms of evidence-based or um, data-based building for is in the, as I mentioned in my presentation, in the business and financial sector. Um, right now, uh, we are coordinating with the OH and uh, we are on at most, on the most part on the advisory level. So uh, we provide uh, technical people to DOH to uh, define the requirements in, at the start of the COVID. So, and another thing, another, um, uh, another action that we took was, or another intervention that um, the ICT has been involved in is in the uh, provision of the data of, of the system for the, um, for for allowing people to travel, so we call this the um, for the people with authority to travel. So we provide them QR codes. Uh, these are now being used by the, the data on this from this data uh, from this application is now being used by the DOH. But uh, in it, there's still no integrated nationwide database that we can use. At the moment, uh, we are lagging in that aspect, uh, especially that we are now only uh, developing, or we are now only um, establishing our Philippine, our national ID system. So it's it's really difficult to have a consolidated database for contact tracing. 
Okay, thank you. Next question, I would like to invite Mr. Denise Suzar. This is uh, one of the questions that has been received from one of our uh, pre-registered participants uh, from Thailand. Uh, the question is, what are the successful policy mechanisms for strengthening digital transformation of local governments? So um, could you share some of, could, uh, elaborate uh, on your uh, ideas uh, to this question further to also the ideas shared by other speakers? And uh, if you could, could you also, uh, uh, explain what are the uh, necessary sets of the skills and knowledge of uh, local government officials uh, the, that need to be equipped with uh, for advancing digital transformation. Uh, Mr. Cesar, please. You're muted, Mr. Cesar. Thank you. I'm, yes. I'm sorry. I was uh, speaking without unmuting um, myself. That's a very, uh, very uh, deep question. Uh, but uh, I can briefly mention, uh, as uh, as I also highlighted in, in my uh, short intervention. I think uh, the first thing is uh, building up portals uh, for uh, for really usage and and. Uh, identifying people's needs uh, and and uh, really investing on that. That's the first thing. And for that, uh, officials can consider doing some uh, surveys uh, or uh, looking at uh, the usage uh, the usage uh, historical information. So that I think that's the first thing. Not only for uh, building uh, for the sake of it or for uh, and definitely not for uh, ranking even though we do the ranking in the UN I don't think that should be uh, at all uh, any objective so uh, building portals for uh, usage the, that's that's one important aspect uh, and uh, also uh, looking at uh, like other uh, examples uh, that are working and in this session we heard from uh, colleagues from different parts of the world uh, there are many many best practices out there so instead of reinventing re the wheel uh, like taking up some uh, existing experiences uh, in that regard for example uh, we have a compendium of best practices uh, uh, in uh, response to pandemic like how governments uh, actually implemented these contact tracing apps, uh, uh, COVID-19 portals. Uh, so there are, there are uh, like more than 600 cases that we have uh, received in the first three weeks of uh, pandemic last March. Uh, like government officials were really busy uh, building up uh, uh, innovative cases. Uh, as you know, there are many different new technologies, AI ha have been used. Uh, uh, so those looking at those cases and then uh, maybe picking up which may work in their in their cases. For example, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence. I mean, I think the the application is uh, still very primitive uh, in the in the government sector. Uh, like the most case that I hear, uh, the most common case that I hear from our uh, from uh, from our. Uh, audience is like using it for uh, chatbots uh, so that people, uh, uh, so that public officials are released from their uh, daily duties and maybe the system can break uh, people, uh, citizens related to the uh, government portal. So this is, this, this may sound very simple, but I think it's, it's very efficient and it was very efficient during the pandemic, uh, like to keep people in in-house uh, so that uh, like some of those e-health apps as well, uh, giving advice uh, so that uh, to also to stop the uh, spread of the virus. I mean, these are a few of the things that I can uh, think of right now. So let me give the floor back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Den uh, Mr. Denis Cesar. Uh, next question, I would like to kindly invite Dr. Uh, Manoda from LPDR to answer. We also received uh, another question through the Q&A box uh, uh, from uh, Van, uh, Vanna uh, Donga Bunfa. Uh, it says, under budget restriction, what uh, do you think should be uh, the top priorities that governments should concentrate at this moment uh, for digital transformation for fast recovery. 
Dr. Aman, um, please share your, your insights on this question, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, similar to, to Laos, we also have uh, this problem, the, the budget restriction. So uh, what we are trying to do now, we are trying to work with the uh, private sector and to help us develop the new technology as we, we know that uh, in terms of new technology, the private sector may be faster than the government. So we are working with the private sector uh, in B BOT model or even TBP model and try to, to create the new service, e-service for the people. And then we can do the, the chair like a PPP. This is what we are trying to do. And of course, I uh, agree with uh, Dr. Saki that the policy is more important and in case of Laos, we are also focusing on uh, trying to develop the digital government master plan and on so the standard decision for the e-government, this will be more important for, for us as well as uh, every developed uh, by ministry can be go with the same standard and can integrate to each other. This can save uh, money for, for the government as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a uh, time for just one more question. Uh, may I invite Dr. Kari for uh, one of the questions that we received from a participant from Nigeria through pre-registration. Uh, how do you think we can promote uh, digital transformation at the local level and revitalize the local economy while ensuring inclusion of vulnerable populations, uh, including uh, informal workers? Uh, Dr. Kari, if you could uh, kindly share your insights on this question, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you much. Appreciated, and uh, uh, and definitely this is a critical question. Inclusion is uh, is uh, is definitely one of the the priorities here. But uh, I would like to link, uh, uh, let's say, the the last question with this one, uh, in terms of priorities. Uh, what can we do in order really to uh, to make sure that there is a, a inclusive uh, uh, access uh, to the service uh, uh, itself. So one is uh, absolutely needs to be access to information uh, through different channels, uh, uh, which is uh, what we name it uh, the different persona, which mean that uh, uh, it doesn't matter if I am a, in the remote area or within this, the, the city center, I really need to have the same uh, uh, quality of access uh, uh, to the same information. It doesn't mean that uh, I cannot uh, uh, see uh, or I cannot hear or I cannot, I have some disabilities uh, uh, that I should be disadvantaged of having access to such kind of information. The technology is allowing us, if we take into the design of the service itself, that uh, it needs to be delivered through a, a multi uh, persona approach. So that's one. The second one is uh, uh, basically, it's, it's sometimes it's really better uh, to have few services that are end to end rather than many services that are uh, basically segregated uh, around the portfolio or the catalog of uh, service that we are. Which mean that uh, it's, I need to be as a user, uh, I need to be, uh, a, seeing where I should uh, get the, the server. Let's take the, the, the civil, for example, uh, uh, aspect. Uh, it starts uh, definitely uh, by building, uh, uh, let's say the civil registry, uh, making sure that it is, uh, I do have the data in the background and then uh, uh, coming and consolidating uh, uh, the different services uh, one after the other uh, uh, over the cycle. Of, uh, of the use of uh, this service from the birth uh, to the death of uh, uh, the person. What type of certificates I need? If I need really to transact, uh, so should I pay on the same uh, way or I have to shift to another medium and another portal and another, uh, uh, let's say channel in order really to uh, do the same thing or part of it. So let's, let's optimize end-to-end -end services uh, which is uh, uh, the second uh, piece. The third and last one, which is uh, basically, again, like Dennis said, it's really about the usability. If I do have the service online, but no one is, uh, is uh, using it, so it's, uh, it's uh, useless. Uh, 
and, and this is where the, the importance of uh, capturing the voices of different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, users. It doesn't matter uh, uh, who is this person, but I need to capture all uh, uh, inclusive voices that uh, are coming uh, to, to get, let's say, the sound of uh, if this service is really uh, usable, uh, if it is uh, easy to use, if it is uh, simple, is it the, the language itself uh, is, uh, is clear? Uh, uh, should I integrate, uh, uh, let's say, some uh, video medium uh, or the, uh, uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, let's say, some vlogs that uh, can explain how to navigate such kind of service? Those are fundamental, simple things, three priorities, where uh, we can really ensure uh, that uh, there is uh, uh, not only access, uh, but also uh, inclusive access uh, to the services end to end. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kari, for your response. Uh, it is now time to wrap up the, uh, the session too. Uh, for the questions that were not be uh, uh, able to be addressed uh, during, uh, during the session due to time constraint, I would like to invite the participants and the speakers to join the online discussion board uh, on the UN WebDOG website for continued discussion. Um, during this session two today, we have discussed the uh, important role of digital technologies and digital government in COVID-19 response and recovery. And we have listened to uh, different country and city cases and experiences and lesson, lessons learned in accelerating uh, digital transformation at the local level. Uh, as it has been emphasized during today's discussion, uh, it is crucial that uh, local government effectively coordinates with uh, the national government and engages and collaborates with other diverse local stakeholders um, uh, for promoting digital transformation in an effective and inclusive way. I would like to once again extend my sincere appreciation to our distinguished speakers and participants uh, who have shared their ideas and questions. And this concludes the session too. Uh, distinguished participants and ladies and gentlemen, we'll now begin the closing session of the UN DESA CRILA Forum. First, I would like to invite Mr. Il Tae Kim, President of CRILA, to deliver his closing remarks. Mr. Kim, the floor is yours. Uh. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm back again. And those of you who are online, thank you so much for all who attended today's uh, forum and helped to make it such a successful event. We have heard many valuable experiences, lessons and the examples of good practices at local, national, and the international levels confronting COVID-19 crisis that can help guide the way forward. As Mr. Jaki Kori from World Bank emphasized today, I think uh, success requires collective action uh, from all of the levels and the whole of society approach the challenge is ultimately one of leadership and we all need to do our part. I thank all panelists and all of you for your participation and important contribution to this forum. It was wonderful to have such a diverse and numerous audience members here today virtually. Especially, I would li also like to express my appreciation to our co-host, UNPO and the UNDESA for their continued partnership and support. It was great to hear so many good practices and perspectives on strengthening public governance and accelerating digital transformation of local government as a key part of the COVID response and recovery efforts to build a more resilient society for the future. I hope 
Today's lesson will learn to respond to your interest and expectation. And they have been productive and insightful. I hope you to stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim, for your remarks. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Pokyun Shim, head of UNPOG, DPID to UNDESA, to deliver his closing remarks. Mr. Shim, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, distinguished participants. I hope you have enjoyed the UNDESA Krilla Forum. Uh, this forum has provided a valuable opportunity to exchange innovative approaches, strategies, and experiences on strengthening public governance and accelerating digital transformation of local governments. I appreciate the thought-provoking presentations by distinguished speakers from national and local governments. Uh, yeah, especially uh, interactive engagement by participants in the Q&A session has also made the discussions of the forum more dynamic and fruitful through sharing substantive ideas and uh, opinions. During the session one, the discussions centered around the challenges confronted by local governments during the COVID-19 and the strategies and practices for addressing them. The important role of local government in the COVID-19 was highlighted based on proximity to local problems and citizens and the capacity to provide solutions that can address the specific local context and needs, particularly effective, innovative, and agile uh, public governance was emphasized for local government, governments to respond to COVID-19 as well as other future crisis situations in an effective and timely manner. Promoting uh, citizen participation and involvement concerted actions across government levels by breaking the silos and collaborating with the various stakeholders across the sectors were stressed as a critical for fostering such effective, innovative and agile government governance. During the session two, the discussions focused on the importance of harnessing ICT and the digital government for effective and inclusive local service delivery, as well as emergency response at the local level and revitalization of the local economy. We have also heard different country and city cases in accelerating digital transformation at the local level for COVID-19 response and recovery with lessons learned, including institutional and technical enablers identified from these experiences. It was uh, emphasized the local government should effectively collaborate with the national government and uh, coordinate with the diverse departments within local government in developing and uh, implementing digital transformation strategies through a whole of government approach. A whole of society approach by partnering with the various stakeholders, particularly businesses, IT sector and expert groups is also imperative for forging innovative solutions and accelerating digital transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope the discussions today can contribute to better strengthening public governance and accelerating digital transformation of local government for sustainable, inclusive and resilient COVID-19 recovery and post-COVID-19 era. I also hope that the forum has provided a good opportunity to build partnerships among us. UNPOG has also created the online discussion board on its website for continued partnership building among participants even after the forum. 
UNPO will make its continued endeavors to support the member states with strengthening public governance at all levels of enabling better COVID-19 recovery and the preparation for the next normal, as well as for accelerating the pace of achieving the SDGs in the decade of action. We look forward to the continued collaboration with the member states and our partners in addressing this challenging issue that requires concerted efforts and actions. Lastly, please allow me to extend my sincere appreciation to all speakers for their insightful and thought-provoking presentations and to colleagues of Krilla under the leadership of President Il Jae Kim for their great collaboration and contributions to organizing this forum. And I hope we can continue this kind of forum year by year onwards. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shen, for your remarks. With this, this is the end of the UN DESA CRILA Forum on Strengthening Public Governance and Accelerating Digital Transformation of Local Government for Emergency Response and Revitalization of Local Economy, the post COVID 19 era. We would like to once again deeply appreciate all participants who have joined us today and stayed until the end of the forum and all speakers for their insightful presentations and discussion. Before we close the forum, may I uh, share several announcements, technical announcements, uh, information to share. First, kindly note uh, that the presentations and video recordings of the forum will become available at, at CRILA and UMPOG's website soon after the forum. Secondly, as shared before, uh, uh, the online discussion board has been created uh, at UMPOG website for continued online discussion, uh, including addressing the questions that could not be addressed during the forum today due to time constraints. We hope this online discussion board can also facilitate uh, continued partnership building among the participants as well. Lastly, we would like to invite you, distinguished participants, to kindly share, spare a few minutes uh, to take part in the post-forum survey. The survey can be accessed via the QR code shown uh, in the screen. Um, our staff, could you kindly share the screen? Please, thank you. Yes, your valuable comments will greatly help us uh, to better improve uh, our future events. Thank you very much once again for your participation and we hope everyone stays safe and healthy and stay connected. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye bye. See, see you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Professor Kim. Bye -bye.